Professor Singor is a heavy set man wearing a Hawaiian shirt and aviator sunglasses. He stalks over to your computer. We'll be back in a moment, continues the interviewer. We're taking we're talking with Professor. Professor Singor pauses the podcast by hitting your laptop space bar and you flinch at this intrusion. He then pulls a cigar from his pocket and lights it. Oh my, I don't really like this guy. And the smell of smoke mingles with the oil smell of the machine shop. I'm writing a grant for D, for, for DARPA, D-A-R-P-A, and I need to see what you're making back here. We ultimately get funded by the Department of Defense, so we have to make sure they're happy with our product. He casts a critical eye on the work you've done so far. This is a prototype, right? He says. You're going to build the final thing out of metal. Yes, sir. And I'm telling the truth. Yes, sir. And I'm lying. No. But we could certainly say it's a prototype in the ground. Or no. The plastic parts are meant to make it easier to repair. I don't think the military should have a problem with that. I'm gonna go with the last one. Sigurd shrugs. Fine. I can see that's a selling point. Professor Tsingor turns to examining your robot's head, which is currently sitting on the table next to the 3D printer. Hmm, that seems alright, Tsingor says. Look like, looks like it could be sufficiently intimidating. Intimidating. And what are you planning to do for arms and hands, Professor Tsingor says. Pterosaurus Rex was the most intimidating dinosaur imaginable, wasn't it? It will have a T-Rex arms. <laughs> That's just dumb. It will have a gun for arms, like Mega Man, that's dumb as well. Mechanical grippers built for strength instead of dexterity. Hmm, I was thinking sort of Swiss Army knife hands with tools that pop out of fingers. I plan to build a soft hand with a good sense of touch. Or I was thinking just why just two arms? It will have lots of arms springing out of its back, like Inspector Gadget. Man, all of these are dumb. Uh, only thing I like is I plan to build a solid hand with a good sense of touch, or I was thinking sort of a Swiss Army knife hands with tools that pop out of fingers. Though I don't like its def uh, definition, so I'm gonna go with I plan to build a soft hands. Touchy fever robots are not quite as easy to sell to DARPA, Sigurd says with a frown. I want my robot to get along with people, you say. That's a universally useful goal, regardless of who's funding it. Plus two empathy, plus one grace. Fine, Zigur says, waving away for the explanation. Carry on then. He turns to leave. I've got to take a call from a New York Times reporter. Funny how journalists all copy each other's story, but each garble the message in a unique way. He makes it to the door, then turns and says, Oh, one more thing. You think your robot can be ready by tomorrow? Someone from the Air Force would be in town, and I told her your robot might be ready to show off by then. You feel your phone vibrating in your pocket. Hmm, bad timing. You resist the urge to check it while talking to your advisor, but it's probably someone with a better offer for what to do tonight. No, there's no way this robot will be done by tomorrow, sorry. Or, the robot will be done, but the demo will be out of the question. We need to test first. Or, of course. Hmm. I think the second one is, is uh, the best one. Professor Sigurd grudging my nods. I can see the logic of that. Maybe we'll just send her a demo video. Then it only has to work once. Professor Sigurd turns and walks out of the machine shop. You find yourself unclenching your hands. Who was calling you while Professor Sigurd was talking to you? Elival. A user experience designer and a supportive friend, or AGL Mame, a manga artist and a generally good guy, or my ambitious friend Josh Anderson, founder of the startup US Robots. Huh. This is interesting. I guess this one will have a huge impact. So, who do we choose? Well, um, I'm gonna rule out AGL Mame. I'm not very in favor of a manga artist, though a generally good guy seems like a nice pick. But I'm kind of tempted it should be my ambitious friend Josh Anderson, founder of the startup US Robots. Uh, let's go with that one. From the missed call, your phone is displaying Josh's profile photo. 
It's a picture of Josh and Ellie from the Freshman Welcome Week dance seven years ago. Ellie is wearing a red Chinese dress with a gold trim, her long, straight black hair falling down to the epaulets. The flash, flash is too bright in the picture, making Ellie's pale skin look wash, washed out. Josh is wearing his usual grey hoodie, not having bothered to dress up for the dance, and his arm is around Ellie. Oh, he's a douchebag, <laughs> he doesn't even dress up. What is the story behind that picture? I was in love with Josh's friend Ellie, but my studies always came first in college. I was in love with Josh, but I never knew how to be more than a friend to him. I had agreed to be Josh's wing person at the dance, and that's where he met Ellie. Or I was testing a music recognition algorithm when these two started bothering me. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go with this one. I agreed to be Josh's wing person at the dance. Yes, you and Josh did everything together. You made a great team. When Ellie started talking to you, you thought at first, from her sense of style, that she was Josh's type. He liked this woman to be snappy dressers, even though he always dressed down. And you introduced them. It turned out they had no chemistry, but you all enjoyed each other's company, and three of you became friends throughout college. You don't see them all that often now, but they're still your friends. You notice that Josh also left you a text. Josh wants to meet for dinner at the burger joint in East Palo, Palo Alto. Man, I have a tough time pronouncing that. He says he wants to run some project ideas by you to see if you're interested in working with his company on any of them. It occurs to you that if you were working with Josh, you might be able to get funding for your education from him instead of Professor Sigurd's military grant. He text back. Sounds great, see you then. Afraid I can't tonight, sorry. I don't reply. I prefer to pretend I missed the text. Well, how are we going to... Well, we have to eat. You know, I, I should probably stay in and work all night. But we need to eat. And a burger sounds pretty good. So sounds great. See you then. Great, Josh texts back. See you then. You spend the rest of the day drilling holes, polishing surfaces, cutting parts, and screwing things together. When you are done, your robot's body stands before you. A plastic biped robot with a mask head and humanoid hands. The whole thing is about three feet tall. Now it only needs a name. What will you name your robot? Pickle, Curry, Miku, The Neo, Kilal, Ariel, Caliban, Famulus, Gardenu. You know, I really like Miku or Ariel. Let's go with Ariel, that's such a cute name. You name your robot after the spirit servant from Shakespeare's The Tempest. You think yourself a little prospero like, after all, and perhaps if Ariel is good, you will eventually set the robot free. Now that Ariel has a body, it might be time to treat Ariel more like a person. With what pronouns will you refer to Ariel? It is just fine, it's not a human. I will refer to her as feminine. I will refer to her to him as masculine. I would prefer to use entirely new pronouns for a robot. Ra, rare, and rim. <laughs> no, let's go with feminine. Ariel is a woman's name. Encouraging people to think of Ariel as a human like as opposed to object-like, should help her get along with people, plus empathy. You look on Ariel's three-foot-tall bipedal body with satisfaction. Now all she needs are motors and a mind. The motors will have to wait for tomorrow, but you've spent years in graduate school writing the code that would form this robot's mind. You can hardly wait to try it out. You take out the smartphone to check the time. It's almost evening. You hurry home to prepare for your dinner with Josh. By the way, how do you feel about your ambitious robot-loving entrepreneur friend? Business people are superficial, good guy to hang around, it's nice to have a sycophant who recognizes my genius, kinda cute I'd say. Uh, good guy to hang around. Yeah, he's pretty laid back for a startup CEO, not that he, this is saying much. <laughs> Aussie is his, Aussie's is a burger place in East Palo Alto which, like East Palo Alto in general, 
is an affordable and unpretentious place filled with frugal software engineers who can afford much more but don't want it. Rock-themed wallpaper has been scrolled on by patrons from long ago, and an old arcade version of Guitar Hero is sitting unloved in the corner. Josh Anderson is hunched over his swanky brick of an Alienware gaming laptop. Oh my god. <laughs> He's wearing a grey hoodie, queer inspired by Mark Zuckerberg, or at least his character in the social network, which Josh has watched way too many times. And the giant orange Beats by Dre, Dre, oh my god, Beats by Dre headphones, could this guy be more of a cliche? His head is moving to the beat of whatever some of these higher metal he's listening to, but he appears intent to lost in thought about whatever is on his laptop. When you approach, he slips down his headphones, which blur some kind of female cover of Led Zeppelin until he closes his laptop. This is the business dinner you're expensing, you ask. Josh sniffs. I'm iconoclastic, not irresponsible. Besides, I like their burgers. A waiter comes by with a menu. Apparently, their burgers are all rock themed. You have the Bohemian Rhapsody, a maple bacon burger, the Hotel California burger, guacamole on a veggie patty, the free bird, a chicken sandwich. Oh, well, that sounds like my kind of meal. You know, people joke about Freebird, but it's actually a really great song. Josh says, It's about doing what you've got to do, no matter what people think. And this bird, you cannot change. Actually, I didn't realize this was a reference to Freebird. I love that song. I haven't heard it in a while, though. Doesn't mean you're not going to criticize me for ordering a chicken sandwich in a burger joint, you ask. I didn't say that, Josh says. What's wrong with you? You decide to cut to the chase. I was wondering if you could pay my tuition for a few years if I agreed to work for you part-time and then full-time after graduation. Josh looks a little skeptical. How much would that cost exactly? You tell him and he looks a little relieved. Okay, as business R&D goes, it's actually not too bad. Man, academics have a cheap labor market. That stings a little because you hadn't really thought of yourself as labor, but Professor Seagull seems to think similarly. Maybe Josh understands Professor Siegel's point of view better than you. Well, I've got a few projects going that you could consult on. He digs into a laptop bag at his feet and produces a table, tablet computer. Just tell me which one you want to work on. Does that mean yes? You ask hopefully. If you find something you like, sure, John says. You're a good candidate. We just need to find a good project fit. Josh does some swiping and tapping and hands the tablet to you. The screen shows a sketch of a robot that has Inspector Gadget-like arms coming out of its back, with each one holding a different surgical instrument, scalpels, calipers, and needle with a thread. Option 1. Surgery bot. I was taking graduate classes in control theory in my first year of college. Let's do it. What if we instead focused on providing robots with good patient skills, who could act as nurses? I think my robots tend to be a little too unpredictable for the operating room. Um, I think this deferred option should give us some other option. <laughs> Josh frowns. Unpredictable isn't really a selling point for most products, he say. You're disappointed because you usually like making robots that explore the world and surprise you. Plus autonomy. How are we standing? Uh, Professor C... Relationship, Professor Singer, 50%, Heavy, good, 55, and Josh, very good, 61. Autonomy, 6, in Beta, Military, Non-Existent, Empathy, in Beta, and Grace, Buggy. Wealth, one, getting by. Um, but if you want to join this venture, Josh continues, the next option might be your best bet. Josh does a swipe on the tablet, and the new image displayed is a little knit all with cartoon eyes and tiny wings. Option 2. The toy market. Now the key to succeeding in the toy market is being able to make a ridiculously cheap product. It just has to be cute, not smart. I've done some Furby hacking. Hacking? <laughs> Who the fuck does hack a Furby? <laughs> oh my god. I've done some Furby hacking. I could probably whip up something cheap but smart for you. 
or great. I have made intelligent stuffed animals before. Let's do it. Um, I'd like to see what else he got, but I don't want to be picky, so... You know what? Intelligent stuffed animals. Let's do it. George seems impressed. You made an intelligent stuffed animal already? When you were young? Sure, I can knit. Plus free empathy. Nice, George says. Alright, let's do it. Do you still want to see Ariel tomorrow? You ask. Nah, that's alright, George says. Not unless you really want to. You spend the meal catching up with talk of the latest games and bands, two of Josh's favorite subjects, and then call it a night. You head home, your mind buzzing with excitement. You can't wait to finish your robot tomorrow. Josh's stuffed animal robot will be nothing compared to Ariel. So yeah, this was chapter 2. Actually, this was chapter 1, but we have finished the prologue in chapter 1 by now. And in the next video, we will move to chapter 2, Machine Learning. So I hope you guys enjoyed the first two episodes. I'm gonna head to bed with my tea that is still steaming hot, despite me recording for at least uh, 30 minutes now. And I'll see you guys next time with more Juice of Robots.